Hello and welcome to another episode of the One Drink Book Club. Tonight my guest is Jason Barnaby, an author in his own right and a sought-after business speaker, uh, not to mention a good, good friend of mine that I've known for over 30 years. Uh, I'm very excited because we're going to be discussing one of my favorite books of all time, A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls. In the book, um, we have a Russian aristocrat named Count Rostov, who is forced into house arrest by the Bolsheviks in 1922. And uh, he is spared the firing squad, but he must spend the rest of his life in the Metropole Hotel in Moscow. The story follows him for the next 32 years as he lives his life in the hotel, finding friendships, love, purpose, and family. The reason I love this book so much and I have recommended it to so many people is that the author creates this incredible character in Count Rostov. Uh, he's this Renaissance man who masters his circumstances uh, of being under house arrest, but is this really um, caring, interesting person who kind of savors all aspects of life. And he has these amazing um, observations throughout. And the author has um, some really neat turns of phrase, uh, elegant language, has a great plot, and the characters he creates in the hotel uh, make you feel like you're there with them. And um, you, you really become invested in their lives and their stories and those relationships. And so uh, when I started listening to this book again in preparation for this podcast, I immediately smiled because it was, it was like greeting an old friend. Jason, welcome to the, the podcast, and uh, thank you for coming. Oh, dude, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm doing very well. I have my, I, I made my little cocktail, which, which I know we're going to get to, but uh, I typically like scarf drinks down, like anything, food and drink. I'm trying to get better at that and like enjoy it. This book was helpful in that respect. So I've just taken a few sips to make sure that it was okay before I suck it down. <laughs> um, well, you know, I was really happy when I asked you to be on the podcast, we talked about what books to do. And I have to admit, I was really excited when you suggested this because we had talked about it. We're both in the same book club and we had talked about it prior. Um, but I was so happy that people enjoyed it because I, you know, when you make a suggestion in a book club, you're always worried that, uh, people aren't going to enjoy it. So when you suggested it, it made me feel good. So I really enjoyed this one because it took me out of if I have a norm, like it took me out of that norm of, of what I would typically, um, typically read and, uh, and listening to it, it was the, the, the gentleman who did the, the reading was so good and I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. He, he is amazing. Um, Nicholas Guy Smith is the voiceover talent who did it. And, um, it's, it's super impressive. And, the, the prose itself is is kind of sing-songy, mm -hmm. and it has this elegance to it, but the uh, voice actor even adds that much more. Uh, yeah. It really is a joy to listen to. I think yeah. if I've heard one criticism of the book is that sometimes it goes in tangents, and there are stories there that don't really advance the plot, so to speak, but I, I loved every one of them, uh, and, and I didn't I didn't feel the need to to rush through it, and, and I think um, savoring was a a common theme. Uh, the count savored meals. He savored drinks. He savored his conversations and his time. And I think I felt like I was savoring the book. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and when we talked about what to do for the podcast and we came upon this one, I was like, well, I got to go back and listen. And I absolutely second your words about welcoming an old friend. And I know that I think you, this was like your third time through, right? For this book, or maybe even more than that. It, 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 it's at least three, uh, if not fourth. Yeah. Yeah. So it was my second and I picked up on, so as you do, right. Things that you miss the first time or, or you see things cause you know how it ends, you know what you're like, Oh, I see where this is going, where you may have missed it before. And that was really cool to, to have that experience again. Yeah. Well, um, you talked about the cocktail. What uh, cocktail did you make, and what uh, what was the? Um, how did you to decide on that? So I will I will tell you that I do not have a I do not have a a deep liquor cabinet, um, and I I'm a little impatient when it comes to I'm really the only person in my family who drinks. My my wife will have wine from time to time, but 
Um, so I'm really the only person who drinks. And so like all the mixers and all the syrups and all the thing, I just, I don't, if I ever have them, they go bad long before I can ever like use them up or they dry out or whatever. So I was thinking about, there was that part in the book where I think it was, uh, uh, I don't remember if the guy was American or British, but he was giving the bartender a hard time at how many, how many ingredients go into the cocktails, right? It's like with eight different ingredients and different colors and all these things. And he's like, you should have, it should just have two, you know, two ingredients that perfectly uh, complement one another. Like gin and tonic, I think was the drink that he was drinking, which I thought like maybe a gin and tonic, but I don't have any tonic. So I was like, well, I'm not going to do that. So I landed on, because this was another reason, well, I'll tell you what I I decided on, and then I'll tell you why. So um, there's a fairly famous, uh, became famous through the show Parks and Rec, a fairly famous steakhouse here in Indianapolis called St. Elmo's Steakhouse. So if you're a Parks and Rec person, you've seen that. And they sell a cherry vanilla bourbon, which is really pretty fantastic. And they sell it at Costco for quite a price. So it's nice to be able to get it there. So I, and I don't, I used to drink soda so much and I very rarely, if ever have soda. And if I do, it's always the zero kind because I think diet is gross, but zero for whatever reason, they've tweaked it enough. So I'm just drinking a um, St. Elmo's bourbon and uh, Coke Zero. So two two ingredients ingredients that very well complement each other, I would say. Nicely done. It's quite tasty. Oh, good. Um, yeah, this, this book actually gave you lots of choices for drinks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was definitely a challenge to decide on just one. And so I actually looked, um, there's a part in the book where, uh, the Chalupin, which is the bar in the Metropole Hotel, uh, the bartender, Odrius had Mm -hmm. put together a series of four cocktails that were the same colors as the spires on St. Basil's Cathedral. Mm-hmm. And so there was a red one, a green one, a yellow one, and a blue one. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did a little research, and apparently um, the author, Amor Tolls, did not actually base those on ingredient on any kind of cocktail recipe. And so uh-huh. somebody had, a-, a fan had asked him, what, how do you make those? And he said, well, why don't you make the suggestion and I'll, I'll take it under advisement. And so, uh, <laughs> they put together awesome. four, four drink recipes. And so, um, the blue one and the green one, both had liquors in it that I do not like to drink. Uh, I generally try to avoid the, you know, fluorescent, uh, liquors. Yes, same. Uh, so the brick wall is a, an ounce of bourbon, an ounce of Amaro Nino, which is an Italian liqueur, an ounce of um, Aperol, and an ounce of uh, lemon juice. And so it actually is known as another name as the paper airplane. If you've ever ah. heard of a paper airplane, I think they kind of adopted okay, yeah. that. Yeah, 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 or, yeah. I have uh, heard of that. Kind of took it that looks on. pretty. So it is pretty, and it's tasty, yeah. too. Wow. Did you, uh, did you shake that up in your cocktail shaker? I did shake it up in my cocktail shaker. Excellent. Um, which I, I tend to like the shaken drinks. They're nice and, and chilly. Yeah. I like them too. I like the little, I like sometimes when you get the little frothy foam on the top too. Oh yeah. A little egg white, mm-hmm. you know, Ooh. adds to that. That's, mm-hmm. that's, uh, those are nice. Yeah, they are. So, um, before we go on, because uh, I know that there are people who listen to this but haven't actually read the book, so I don't want to get too far into Ooh, it and yeah. give anything away. Uh, but I want people to know, hey, they've, they've now got two good drink uh, suggestions. Yep. But um, what else are you reading right now that you're excited about and that you would want to um, encourage people to uh, take a look at? So I, I'm actually – this. I don't know if people would be excited to read this book. Um, that I'm currently reading. Actually, I'm re- I, I'll give two suggestions, and both of them will go along with this thing that I do um, every year called um, I have a word in, a word that I want more of in my life, and I have a word out that I choose every year that just kind of stays with my stays in my life. So my word this year, I have my little my little bracelet is con. They couldn't get contemplation on there, so I just have contemplate. 
So um, in the mornings, I do just some uh, quiet reflection time, and I'm reading a book by Richard Rohr called Just This. And it's just a, it's a, it's actually a short, small, square book that has um, like page, page and a half of just like reflective types of um, prompts for you, if you will. And then the other one that I'm reading, which I found to be very interesting, here comes my puppy, if you just heard the, the door creak. Um, the other one that I'm reading, reading is called Buddhism Without Belief. And um, it just talks about the Four Noble Truths and how those truths were meant to be practiced and not necessarily meant to, to become a belief system. So it walks through those. And again, it's one of those like, these are books for me that I've I read it and then... I go back and reread pages because this stuff is like, it's like a, it's like a really thick stew. You just, you, it just takes a while to get through it. Um, but I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying both of those. And currently also listening to um, Black Like Me, which we are listening to for our book club. So I guess I have nice. three going on. All right. Yeah. Those are, those sound good. Yeah. Um, I, if I were going to make any suggestions right now, especially based on, uh, a Gentleman in Moscow is the other two books written by Amor Tolls. Uh, Gentleman in Moscow was his second book. Oh. And his first book, uh, uh, Rules of Civility, which was also excellent. Although I will say, I kind of like uh, Gentleman in Moscow a little bit more, which is kind of unusual for like a big second album, so to speak. You know, uh-huh, a lot of times yeah, you yeah, feel yeah. you had yeah. a lot of success with your first album. And then, you know, right. there's a lot of pressure on that second right. one. Yeah, there is. Um, which I think he rose to the challenge for sure. For sure. Yeah. And then the most recent one is called the Lincoln highway, which I thought was excellent. So I would suggest any of the three as, as really good books that um, you will, you will enjoy immensely. Well, I will tell you, uh, Jamie, I have um, learned or I have come to respect your um, recommendations as there has not been one that I've been like, eh, so I'm looking forward to reading those other those other two. All right. Well, um, oh, the last question before we get into the book is what would, you know, I think people understand that we both like it, but what would be your rating out of five? Oh, I would totally give it a five out of five. Yeah. I, th- I I thought that it was, um, you know, the the rabbit trails that it takes and, and the sort of unfinished stories, especially for me when you're listening to it. Um, really, I mean, it's just, it's just fantastic. And the fact that like, when you think about the book as a whole and where he took, you know, like the story about his sister and the officer and how all of that and how it tied back to like the warming of, you know, temperatures and the difference that a degree or two makes, like how all of that was like woven together I'm just I'm completely fascinated by people whose whose brains can can come up with something like that because it you know you're following along with the story and you're like oh yeah that that fits and that fits but when you get to the end and you think of all the things that they've woven through all of that it's really impressive and that's I would say especially on the second listen had a lot more um appreciation for that than I did the first time uh, agreed. And I too, I, of, of, of the books, um, we've done on the podcast, I have not given anybody a five, but I, I have to give this one a five because it, it really is, uh, in my top five reads of all time, uh, definitely. And so, um, so just a quick reminder to people to, um, please review and, uh, subscribe if you can to the podcast on whatever platform you're listening to it. And, um, I will tell you it is fall or approaching fall. It's hot sauce season. My hot peppers are coming in. So if you leave a review, um, somebody who leaves a review will get a free bottle of hot sauce, um, of your choice. I have several flavors. So just, just um, had a a couple of dashes of your hot sauce the other night when I was making some stuff. So for those, I, I am a satisfied customer and a highly recommending one as well. Excellent. So, uh, all right, let's get into the book because um, uh, Count Rostov, who is the main character, um, is immensely likable. 
I mean, he's such a, a an interesting character. Um, but what what struck you as the why did you like him? Because there's so many aspects of his personality um, that are interesting and um, approachable. Yeah, you know, f- f- for me, I would say the things that that drew me to him pretty immediately were his he's incredibly attentive. Um, you know, he talks about other people in the book who are quite attentive, but you know, he, he gets a, he gets a name for knowing who needs to sit where at family, you know, gatherings and big parties. And he just, he knows, he knows those, like all the goings on and he just seems to very easily walk through all that. It's a second nature kind of thing to him. And I think there was even a part where his sister's like, why do you care? Like, you know, where people sit, they're going to have a good time anyway. And he was so offended. He's like, why do I can't do the I can't do the accent, but why do I care? Like, why do I like, like woman kind of, you know, that sort of, so I loved his, um, his attentiveness to things. And I really appreciated his intentionality with everyone like he, and, and how decorum guided his intentionality because he was a gentleman and how that to me always showed up first in how he behaved and how he responded. And I, I just, I, I've always been fascinated by that kind of society and the way that he did it. Um, I just thought it was really admirable and it was fun to, to see, you know, in every, in every scene that he was in, like, well, but you know, how attentive and intentional is he going to be and how is he going to go about it? That was really fun to watch or listen to. Yeah. It was interesting. I mean, there's, there's a, there's kind of this, this interesting um, thing that he was a gentleman in the sense that he was an aristocrat. He was part of this upper class. And so, so much of his manners and his understanding of the way the world worked, the way he, he knew how to behave in all of these social situations. He knew uh, the best way to, to act. But I, I think that one of the things differentiated him is that he did not have, he was not a snob. He treated everyone. He, he did not think that his station in life was better than someone else's station. He understood that he was an aristocrat. And he even said that in the very first scene, he's under, um, under arrest, he's in basically this courtroom where they are saying, you know, uh, we're going to, why should we not kill you? Um, and he talks about that his job is to be a gentleman. Like, I, I don't understand. Like, he sees it as his role to be this um, kind of like a social conduit. Uh, he was always known for being a good conversationalist. He was known, as you said, how to interact with people and how to basically be a good party host and how to, to do things. But he truly did not feel any better than anyone else. And so I feel that he is a uni- while he's a gentleman and that encompasses this large group of people who were the aristocrats, I think he was very different than other aristocrats because he did not look down on anyone. Well, and, and I would also say that part, um, I mean, are we allowed to talk about like what happens towards the end? Like, are we allowed to do spoiler alerts? Yeah, I think we, I mean, we'll, we'll give some warnings. We'll do some spoilers. I don't want to reveal kind of the, the end end on sure, uh, sure. that kind of adventure part, but, um, right. but yeah, go ahead. But and... I, I, I think for me, the, the, what proves what you just said more than anything is what he winds up doing for a great deal of the time that he's in the metropole. And that is to become a waiter, right? Like yeah. to serve other people and the pride that he took and the way that people leaned on him and counted on him and looked up to him and followed his direction to me really speaks of like, I agree with you. I think I think he looked at his life as a gentleman, as an aristocrat, as a calling, really. Like that was something that he was fulfilling. It wasn't just because he was born in a particular station. He felt a responsibility to that. And what I loved is that, you know, it ultimately came, you know, in the way that he served, you know, 
served other people. And it just, I think it flowed very naturally from who he was. When that revealed itself in the book, I remember thinking, well, of course that's what he's doing. Like yeah. that makes perfect sense. And, and the fact that um, he, he chose to do that. And as you're right, it was more important for him to have this great restaurant that had this great chef and this great maitre d' run well than it was yes. for him to be served well, if that yes. makes sense. Yes, you know? yes, hundred percent, hundred percent. And it was um, there's there's a phrase that comes in multiple times in the book where the count um, who had been exiled many times in his life. This is one of the things I was trying to as I was kind of examining it and thinking about it for this podcast, um, early on in life, his parents died when he was young uh, Mm -hmm. and he kind of got exiled, even though it was to an enjoyable place was to his grandmother's house kind of mansion. um, Mm -hmm. And then uh, at a certain point, there's an event which, you know, where he has to basically escape Russia and lives in Paris for four years. He's kind of exiled in Paris. Mm -hmm. And then for, the whole period of the book that you have that you stay with him, he is exiled in the hotel. Yeah. And his stepfather or his, his godfather who raised him had always said that if one uh, did not masters master one's circumstances, he was bound to be mastered by them. Mm -hmm. And it truly is a theme throughout Mm -hmm. where the count is put in all these situations where he could, have gone lots of different ways. He could have been nostalgic about the old times. He could have been bitter about his situation, but he always looked at it as an opportunity and something to look forward, yeah. uh, forward thinking. And and he never was very bitter about much of anybody. No, he um, really wasn't there. I was trying to think of two, there. He, he found the good in most people, almost everyone that he dealt with. The two people were the bishop, who was a reoccurring yeah. uh, character, who he even was more annoyed by than he was, was dismissive or angry at. Right. And then the other one was the Hazan, who mm-hmm. um, had kind of injured his sister's honor. Yeah. And... Um, but the re- I mean, really, those were the only two people that he had any kind of ill will for. Right. And even even the Bolsheviks, who have basically run his family, run his aristocratic friends out of the country, right. he he saw them as well. This is the new this is the new system. I guess right. you know, there's always going to be change. This is the change that we're experiencing. Right. He, he didn't even seem bitter about that. No, he didn't. He didn't. And I, you know, again, I think. When you look at what you're doing in life, and this is, I, I do believe that this is how he saw it, as a calling, and the things that you're doing in your everyday are fulfilling that calling, it's hard for you to be bitter when you feel like everything that you're doing is fulfilling that thing for which you've been put on earth. And I really feel like that, I, th- I think that was pervasive in, in who he was and what he did throughout the book. Uh, agreed. Um, and I feel it, w- one of the things I enjoyed about the book is that there are different sections that, I mean, there's really the, the table of contents says, you know, there's book one, book two, book three, book four. Um, and in those periods, they jump in further distances of time. So in the first, uh, the first chapter is, is year one, the next one is the next year, but then it immediately starts accelerating and then it decelerates towards the end. Um, but there are characters that he interacts with that that basically um, each book kind of highlights. And in the, the first book, he meets a little girl named Nina, who also lives in the hotel, whose mother has died and really becomes his best friend. And they, they go on adventures in the hotel. Um, she's a very precocious, intelligent uh, girl who is uh, really, you know, kind of he doesn't know how to deal with kids. He hasn't really dealt with them. Uh, but he, he forms this friendship with her, which is really a neat thing to watch. And then, uh, in this, you know, as you said, there's another part where he, he becomes a a part of the hotel in the way that he hadn't, he had lived there for many years, but he had not worked there. And so when he decides to, uh, join the staff of the Boyarsky, which is the high end restaurant, um, as a server, as a head waiter, uh, he 
is very, um, you know, he becomes friends with the maitre d' and the chef, the triumphant, uh, who become his best friends, uh, and they all really enjoy uh, their each other's company and their love of food and wine and service and and um, that's a really special experience. And then uh, later he ends up becoming um, the little girl Nina ends up dropping off her daughter in in a an emergency situation who ends up living with the count and he raises her as his own daughter. So he becomes a father in that as well. And so, and then I, the end kind of ends like a, almost like a James Bond movie. So it has a little it, bit of everything. Yeah, I feel it like it does. Uh, and, and I don't know if there was a part of those books. I do have a question here. Is there a part that you felt <laughs> that you liked more than, than the others? Oh man. Um, I would say I liked when he, the, I definitely liked the part when Sophia came into his life because, I mean, anybody with children knows that they just upend <laughs> everything. And, you know, he, he talked about how he was, how he had always prided himself on being such a great conversationalist and how. Sophia just why 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 and I mean it just took me back to my children like every every answer you gave led to that many more whys and it why why it, and it was insatiable and just you know as cultured as he was as traveled as he was as educated as he was like he was bested by a little girl and she, and I just thought that was fantastic and I also liked the the part where um you know, when he had, you know, made plans to, you know, end the way things had been going and he winds up being befriended by one of the, I think he was a maintenance guy or something, but the, the guy that was on the roof and like how things unfolded around, because life just became very different at that part of the book. And you had already gotten a lot of the history. So for me, I think that middle piece, I mean, the end was spectacular. It, it really was the, you know, you're like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? But I, for me, I really like that middle piece because th there was a lot of change that was happening in Russia. The whole like taking off of the, the uh, labels of the wine bottles, you know, all that stuff that went on, which was, you know, that, that represented so much for him. And then it was just, you know, even got into it, you know, that's, that's ultimately why the bishop did it because he, you know, he overrode one of the bishop's suggestions. Um, but I just, I really enjoyed that, that middle space of the book of like what he did once he kind of, to me at that point, he kind of, he had come to terms with the fact that he was never leaving, but also didn't just settle with like, I'm just going to stay in my room. Like he made a life of it. And I thought that was really fun to see how he did that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. There are two parts in the book where um, the, the count is so kind and polite and generous to people throughout the book. And there are two situations where his, his um, where he kind of um, got cocky a little bit. And one of them which was with the Hazan. And he had this episode where he beat him at cards and then kind of socially embarrassed him. And, and it came back and bit him because that guy came and, 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 and broke his sister's heart and did it just to, as revenge for the counts beating him. And later when he had kind of corrected in an aristocratic condescending way, the Bishop, he came back and, and took all the labels off of 10,000 bottles of wine, which were the Count's pride and joy. So in both cases, when he, he kind of got over his skis on being um, a little bit too, uh, too cool for school, uh, yeah. it, it bit him. In the and the thing that I really loved about that, um, that particular scene when the Count did not know that the, that the labels had been taken off of the wine bottles because the bishop was waiting on him, right? And he's like, are you going to have the red or the white? And he's like, well, I'm going to, you know, and he goes, and I'm going to have this because it's going to be this and it's going to be this perfect thing. And, blah, blah, blah. and he goes, so do you want the red or the white? You know, and it was just like in his own condescending way, it was the bishop getting back at him. And I just thought 
it was pretty hilarious. And then, you know, for him to actually go into the, the wine cellar and to see the pile of labels that had been, you know, scraped off the bottles. And I, I did I, a little research because a lot of the things that talk about Soviet, um, the Soviet situation and, and the history of that time were drawn from real events and had examples. There was no example apparently of, of the Soviets going into the Metropole's wine cellar and, and taking all the wine labels off, but uh, and it yet certainly could have been. It I was going to say, and yeah. yet totally believable. Oh, right. Absolutely. When you when you think about how things could have gone, yeah. So so um, obviously, Sophia and Nina were central characters, but there are a lot of other characters in the book uh, who played big parts in the Count's life. Mm-hmm. Um, was there anybody that you particularly? Uh, was fond or fond of I really and I, I I'm terrible when uh, I'm trying to recall stuff like this but the uh, oh I do remember his name Ossip I really really appreciated Ossip um, I appreciated him for his um, cloak and daggerness that he had you know he didn't reveal who he was I loved the the banter that they had at the very beginning, their first meeting, when he's like, you know, would do you think, do you think that I'm a gentleman? And 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 he and again to the attentiveness, right? Like the count was like, well, no, and here's why, and just how they like how that started, and it was so you know, it was just awkward and very like Asip clearly had the upper hand because he knew, and he's got this bodyguard with a gun, and you know all this stuff. And then how they became friends and kind of argued like school boyfriends over like, are you going to watch the movie? Or are you going to talk through the whole thing? And like how that went back and forth. But what I loved most of all was how he showed up for him when Sophia, that was just so great. And there was still the cloak and daggerness, right? With the, the van that he goes and gets in with all the fresh bread and, um, you know, gets a chance to go through the streets of Moscow and he's, and he's, you know, looking around and seeing how things are so different because he hasn't been out in so many years. But I loved, I, I, I think Asip said something like, you know, you have served me for so long. It was a pleasure to finally have an opportunity to serve you. And yeah, that was cool. That he was a, he was a great character. Um, and the it's funny. I was thinking. Um, I can't think of another book, movie, story, etc., where the KGB uh, the KGB agent was a <laughs> a cool somebody guy you liked. Um, <laughs> you re- totally true. <laughs> now, because most of the KGB people were like his bodyguard, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And um, you're you're right. The 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 inner the exchange when they first met, and and uh, for the listeners, Ossip was a KGB. Uh, agent who wanted to learn how aristocrats thought he wanted to learn how people in the West thought. Mm -hmm. And he decided that um, the count was a resource. And so would come to him once a month uh, on a regular basis and basically get lessons on how to act, how they think, what is good. So they'd watch movies, they'd watch, uh, they'd read books. um, And they, he basically gave him a cultural lesson uh, but it, it was it developed into a friendship that lasted for years. Yeah, you know, he he was a great character. Um, there were so many though that were. Uh, I I thought the the friendship between uh, Emil the chef and Andre the the um, uh, maitre d was really special, and that I thought um, was something where the if. Men have a hard time, uh, I think, making close friendships. And to see those guys open up to one another and then share their love of, uh, share love and respect because they all had talents that they they thought very well of one another. And so I thought that was a really neat. And uh, and I I really I loved the meal that they had together. Find you know that all the things that had to come together. The that came, meal. Yeah, the the bouillon based meal was so cool. And you know I I am a huge proponent. Uh, you know I I teach this when I when I do leadership sessions. I I teach it when I develop teams. I talk about it 
you know, when I speak, but this, this ability and this desire to be curious is such a powerful thing. And I was really struck when they finally had the meal together and partially because of time, I'm sure partially because of the meal, but also partially because of the drink that they finally opened up to one another and they, they, uh, the things that they learned, you know, that the, um, was it the maitre d' that was, that used to be, I think it was, it was a maitre d' that was, had been in the circus. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you know, and, and, and what he winds up juggling and, you know, it, it, I just thought that was so cool. It's like, you know, here are these people and I've, I see this all the time. Like you're with people that you know, but then suddenly if you just lean in and get a little curious and you ask a question and you listen, which I think the count was really, really good at, it's amazing to me the things that you will learn. And I just find that most people don't take those opportunities. And that was one of the things I really appreciated about him and their relationship. That was really neat. Totally. So uh, another thing that I loved about the book was the role of the Metropole Hotel itself. Um, the author's descriptions of the, the hotel and its charms and its rooms, um, you could almost go through, I was thinking about this last night, if you chose any room, I could tell you my favorite story in the book that happened in that room. And so, I mean, I'm thinking of the Piazza and the, uh, the, for the Piazza, I think it would have been the, the exchange where he had a, a first date next to him, sitting next to him. And he helps them out by pointing out the best wine that would go with the Latvian stew. And um, uh, the, the Boyaski had lots of great scenes. The private dining rooms with Ossip had great scenes. The kitchen had great scenes. Um, and, and his his rooms up in the belfry were, you know, had some really neat things going on. And so I, I feel like, um, it, it, the first time I read it, I definitely went to, uh, the internet and looked up old pictures of the Metropole and, and he really, you know, the author really did base all these things on how it really does look and, and clearly spent time there. Um, but do you have any, what are your, what struck you about the hotel, uh, that, or, or the its role. Yeah. Well, what I really liked was when he talked about how, um, how hotels, other hotels had been built for the guests of the hotel, but this hotel had been built for the people of Moscow. Like it was, mm -hmm. and I, and, and you saw that throughout the different places, you know, when the, you know, all of the, the journalists that would gather there and the different things that would happen and the famous people that came through. I really enjoyed the high back chair between the potted, the potted palms in the lobby <laughs> because I'm a people watcher. So I yep. could totally, and again, his attentiveness, right. To sit there while he's, you know, reading his paper. Um, but also I'm sure taking all of it in and, uh, I mean, I, I used to work in a mall and I would take my lunch and I would get it to go and I would go literally sit in the middle of the mall so I could just watch people walking by when they were, you know, while I was eating. And, um, but I love that he said that about the way that the, again, I think it goes back to intentionality, the intention with which this hotel was built and how you can see throughout the book that it really fulfilled that purpose. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Uh, and I liked when uh, the Soviet Union was starting to open up more to the West and you got more uh, journalists coming to the hotel and visitors from other countries, it, it clearly added to the Count's uh, ability to socialize with the outside right. world because right. he was constantly looking at the world through the lens of whatever came through the hotel. Right. And so I think that the different time periods really helped um, kind of expand yeah. his horizons yes. when he could could kind of interact with those people. Yeah. I also did really love when he made the, when he figured out that behind the wardrobe was the, you know, extra room. It was very lion, witch in the wardrobe esque. I just, I've always wanted a place like that, like a secret door somewhere. So I really loved that piece about it too. 
the the only thing is that the bishop was so nosy and so invasive i can't believe that he never found out about the extra room it seemed like something he would have discovered totally. on day three uh, totally just the nosy bastard that he was <laughs> he was a nosy bastard <laughs> um uh one of you know i i've talked about uh, the way the author phrased things in some of his observations being so um, uh, just elegant and you, you to- have to, you have to repeat what what it was that you said to me in the text message the first time that we read this book because oh, I thought I thought about that so many times as I was rereading this again. Uh, I think I said there there's there's phrases that just make my heart swoon. Um, which is, which, which I thought was so sweet and so like, <laughs> like in a very endearing way. And I will tell you that like, after you said that and, and looking, you know, listening again, I was really looking for some of those and I did highlight, I did not go back and re-listen before we did this, but I'll send you some of them. I did highlight them in the, in the audible version. Cause you can, you know, put your thumb on it and it will record the the pieces at least with the one i did it will record the pieces that you wanted to hear and there were some that i was like "Ooh, there's a there's a good turn of phrase and i would rewind and record it again so i'm looking forward to after this going back and just listening just to the pieces that i saved but i thought that was really cool it's funny you say that because um i did some of the same thing i actually went ahead and got the Kindle version of the book too, so that you could search for some of them. Cause I could remember oh, the phrase yeah. and I could find it. And there was a couple of the ones that I jotted down uh, before tonight was um, the count goes on about the time between placing the order at a restaurant and the appearance of the appetizer being the most perilous times in all human interaction, <laughs> which I thought was such an, what a lovely description. Uh, I, I wrote it down here. He says, what young lovers have not found themselves at this juncture in a silence so sudden, so seemingly insurmountable that it threatens to cast doubt on their upon their chemistry as a couple? What husband and wife have not found themselves suddenly unnerved by the fact that they might not ever have anything urgent, impassioned, or surprising to say to one another ever again? I just thought that so was such good. a great uh, so observation. Uh, another one I wrote down, was uh, he has a love interest we haven't talked about Anna at all, yeah, but his, right. he has a love interest that visits the hotel. She's an actress, and she she has an interesting transformation because she was this very famous actress, but then um, kind of has this situation where she's no longer the young new star and has to figure out another way to kind of be, stay relevant and become right. another person. And so, in this kind of trough of her life. Uh, he was explaining that actually he did the count didn't explain this. There is a narrator that pops in to the mm-hmm. book. And when you listen to the book, the narrator is not so obviously not the count. Yes. You kind of assume it's the counts um, what's going on in the count's head, but it's not. And I think in the book, it's a little more obvious that it's mm. the narrator, mm-hmm. which is an interesting vehicle. But uh, he was saying that this at the soirees in the house, uh, when Anna had a fancy DACA and, and had the things it said that Anna mastered the ancient art of descending a staircase, mm-hmm. uh, but having mastered the art of descending the stairs to a gathering of admirers, she had yet to master the art of ascending the stairs alone. And there is a scene yeah, where she yeah. tries to, sw- you know, I can see to- that scene right in my head to the way he described it. Yeah, where she tries to woo a uh, an up and coming director and invites him up for a nightcap, and he uh says no i i got this thing i gotta go thanks to. but no thanks yeah which was it's such a and and actually that was another that brought on another um phrase which was the confederacy of the humbled mm-hmm. and they mentioned that you know, the other count had had joined the confederacy of the humbled he was mm-hmm. no longer a, a, an aristocrat he was no longer somebody with titles and right. and all of these other things and she had kind of become yeah. the humbled so and uh, they found it, love there which yeah, is cool. Exactly. Uh, here in Washington, there's lots of people who have joined the Confederacy of the Humbled. 
Uh, I wish they were the ones that were actually in office. That'd be great. I I see them all the time. And you know what? I will tell you, I would much rather have dinner with somebody in the Confederacy of the Humbled than somebody who is not quite there yet. A hundred percent. Boy, they're so much more pleasant. A hundred (laughs) percent. Yes. Um, So the last topic, uh, or my last question is, talks about... um, at the close to the end of the book, uh, Count Rostov has a discussion with Sophia, who is his adoptive daughter. And he says his greatest purpose in life was to be at the hotel mm-hmm. when Sophia's mother, Nina, needed help. Um, and he he truly took on this role of father and caregiver uh, mentor to Sophia, incredibly serious. And I think he saw it as the greatest uh, role of his life. And, and as you are a father, I'm a father. How did that, you know, affect uh, you? Dude, I told you before we started recording that, you know, I had, I'd already, I read that question a couple of times today. Cause you sent me these ahead of time just to, to look at. And I, I, and I'm telling you the first time I read it today, I was at work today and I read it and I was like, I'm like tearing up sitting in my chair here at work. Like what the heck's going on? Um, I will say, so, you know, we've got a 24 year old, a 19 year old and a 15 year old. So we like really span the gamut and it is, I am experiencing a similar feeling when my 19 year old and 24 year old call home about something because like, how do I want to say it in that moment? Like where he feels like that was, you know, his his greatest purpose in life was to be at the hotel when she needed help. Like for me to be able to answer the phone call about how do you change your oil or I just got this check and how do I deposit it online and how does that work? And though you may have told them the things that they're asking about a hundred times, the fact that they're still willing to call and ask and you can still fulfill that purpose. I mean, it's, I didn't totally lose it, but I do have tears in my eyes. Like it's, I mean, that's, that's, I I don't, I don't, if you're, if you've never had kids, I don't know if you can really grasp that. And I certainly couldn't before I had them, but like there is, there's, there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. Yeah. And, and, and to me, I do believe like it's a, I mean, it's something that you don't outlet, you don't outgrow, you don't finish, like it's never finished, right? There's always, your kids are always your kids. You're always their parent. And, uh, you know, my dad's 82 and I still call him and ask him some similar things that my kids are asking me. And it's, <laughs> I hope that he feels the same way I feel when when my kids ask me those things. It's just it's a it's a privilege to be able to I mean, we've got you know, one mom and one dad, right? Like and to to have that privilege of of that position in life. It's there's there's nothing else like it. That's pretty cool. Well, on that note, Mr. Barnaby uh, yeah. I, uh, I think, um, uh, I will hold my last sips up as a cheers to both the book, to my guest. And, um, uh, again, we highly recommend the book if you haven't read it, but my guess is that if you lasted this long, you probably read it and wanted to hear somebody else talk about it. So, um, I hope, uh, to, uh, my, my cheers is to, uh, I hope that, um, uh, Mr. Toll's keeps writing and keeps uh, spinning out some great yarns. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, please join us for our next episode. Subscribe, review, and um, come back for more. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.